Hey everyone, this is Deepa Shri. I would like to start the video with the famous Sanskrit slogan, Yatra Naryastu Pojyate Ramantu Tatra Devata, which means where women are worshipped, there the gods rejoice. In the country where on one side women are fighting for the stands, and on the other side where some women are victimizing men by false allegations, does this age-old Sanskrit slogan still hold good? Let us try to understand that in the video. Firstly, to understand what feminism is, the Oxford Dictionary defines feminism as the advocacy of women's rights on the grounds of equality of the sexes. The feminist group started protests with the objective of throwing light on the gross inequalities and atrocities faced by women. The feminist group succeeded in grabbing the legislative's attention and soon the laws were amended to make women equal with men. Please note, these were the times when women were seen as the slaves of their husbands. The various issues feminism tries to address are birth ratio, to have equal male and female population, marriage to prevent child marriage, clothing to prevent gender specific dress code. Now let us look how these feminist activities gave rise to anti-male laws. These are the sections from Indian Penal Code. And the first section we will be discussing is section 304B of Dowry Death. This section leaves us with the opinion that every unnatural or untimely death of a married woman is dowry death, which might not be the case always. This section is gender biased because under this section, even if the allegation is false, there will be trial and the husband is considered guilty until proven innocent. This is very much against the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which proclaims that everyone, like every human being, irrespective of their gender, charged with a criminal offense should be assumed innocent until proven guilty. But it is clearly not the case with this section. This section also follows the prejudice that all women who commit suicide within seven years of marriage does so only because of dowry harassment. Section 354, assault or criminal force to women with intent to outrage or modesty. This section deals with assault on women hurting her modesty. While this section broadly covers various offenses hurting women modesty, it clearly lacks to provide the same protection to men. Section A, B, C, D of 354 deals with various attempts to cause hurting women modesty. This is gender biased again, because men's dignity is given no value in the eyes of law. And there are also high chances that women can either make false allegations against men, or they can boldly go and commit these acts, which are otherwise prohibited to men under this act. Section 375 of rape. According to me, this is by far the most interesting section because of how it is blind to male rape. Please read, this section says that only man can be raped, only man can rape and only women can be raped. Sorry, I stand corrected. I repeat that again. This section says only man can rape and only women can be raped. And it lays rigorous punishment for rape of not less than 10 years and may extend for life imprisonment. This section underwent amendment in 2013, making it gender neutral. And soon there were very strong objections by feminist groups. And then again, it was amended back to gender specific. The feminist groups put forward various propositions, few of them being men not being as vulnerable as women, men as always wanting sex, and women not being capable of raping a man. Soon this section was amended, making it gender specific. It is very sad to know that many researchers suggest that men are also sexually assaulted and it is greatly prevalent than women rape. Lack of recognition of male rape in the eyes of laws leaves men with no option to fight under this section. 
Section 493 of IPC is of cohabitation caused by man decidedly inducing a belief of lawful marriage. This section says, suppose if a man decidedly makes a woman believe that they are married, even though they are not, and cohabits with her or has sexual relationship with her, she will be subjected to punishment. This seems fine, but the loophole is that what if a woman fraudulently makes a belief, man believe that they are married and cohabits with him or has sexual intercourse with him? And the man cannot fight for his rights? Moving ahead to section 498A, husband or relative of husband of a woman subjecting her to cruelty. This section specified that if cruelty and harassment are shown to be inflicted upon a married woman by her husband or by any relative of her husband, such husband or such relatives of the husband shall be punished. This again seems gender biased because it does not recognize harassment on husbands by wife or her relatives. And also researchers suggest that every year twice as many married men compared to women commit suicide, succumbing to verbal, emotional, economic and physical abuse by their wives and in-laws. Because men are always seen as strong personalities and it might be a shame to them to come out openly and discuss about the harassment. And also there is clearly no recognition under the eyes of law for women, uh, men harassment by women. Let us look at some of the feminist laws under Hindu law. The first section we'll be talking about is section 10 of Hindu Succession Act 1956. This section is about distribution of property among highest and class one of the schedule. This section says that the property without a will on demands of the property owner shall be divided among the wife, children and the mother of the deceased person. This is again so gender specific. It considers only wife, children and mother as the dependents and only them being privileged to have the share of the property. And the father of the deceased is only eligible if the deceased does not have wife, children or mother. What if the father was solely dependent on the deceased person and once the deceased person is dead, there is no section for the father to claim the share in this property. Section 14, property of a Hindu female to be her absolute property. If a Hindu female possesses a property by inheritance, then such a property is regarded as an absolute property and has no obligation to share it with her co-partner. While it is not the same case for Hindu male, he has to take the consent of the co-partners before dealing with the property. Then we have Hindu Adoption and Maintenance Act 1956. Under this act, a Hindu boy is entitled to maintenance only till he attains majority, that is 18 years. While a Hindu girl is privileged to have maintenance till her marriage. And again, it is assumed that she'll be taken care by her husband. This act is, seems gender biased because it weaves, first of all, it weaves girls as incapable and needing maintenance from her parents till the time of marriage and later from her husband, which is again a dependency on a man. man. And it is being unfair to boys because there might be chances where some boys are physically incapable of standing on their own feet and they might actually need the maintenance and they might want to be dependent on their parents. But this section provides no room for such maintenance for men after attending their majority. Then we have Hindu Marriage Act 1955, section 19 to which petition shall be presented. Under this section, under the subsection 3a, if the wife is the petitioner, the case shall be presented before the district court within the limits where the wife is residing at the time of presenting the petition. 
which means if a uh, wife and the husband are separated and if the wife files the petition separately then the uh, it is obligatory for the husband to attend the uh, cases at the court where it is convenient for the wife special marriage act 1954 section 37 this act we all know it allows for inter religion and inter caste marriage and it does not gown for uh, hindus this section says that only wife is entitled for permanent alimony and maintenance and vice versa is not enforced meaning the husband cannot claim for maintenance or permanent alimony from the wife but we all know that hindu marriage act allows both the husband and the wife to claim permanent alimony and maintenance but section 37 of the special marriage act 1954 gives this privilege only to women making it unbiased towards men so by all this it is very clear that there is clearly no equality between the both the genders so what is gender equality unicef says gender equality means that women and men and girls and boys enjoy the same rights resources opportunities and protections it does not require that girls and boys or women and men be the same or that they be treated exactly alike so gender equality has been empowering women by putting an end to many types of discrimination that have existed from centuries we all know that very much what kinds of harassment women are gone through and violence against women with families and at workplace has been reduced by gender equality and exploitation child early and forced marriage and archaic practices that damaged women's bodies have been reduced that's really great of gender equality and there are certain constitutional privileges as well for achieving gender equality those are all listed in the slides you can take your time and go through each of those the first one being article 14 the famous article 14 which is for equality before law for women then we have article 15 subsection 1 the state not to discriminate against any citizen on grounds of only of religion race caste sex place of birth or any of them here sex is mentioned to make it general neutral then we have article 15 subsection 3 the state to make any special provision in favor of women and children this is kind of a privilege for women to bringing them equal to men then we have article 16 equal opportunity in matters of public employment to have equal participation of women in the workplace article 39a equal pay for equal work then we have article 51a for safeguarding women modesty article 243d seats to be reserved for women in panchayat article 243t seems to be reserved for women in municipality these are all the various privileges given for women and women only in the constitution and it is very clear that we don't do not have any privileges specifically for men so this leaves us with thought that is gender equality a feminist approach let us clarify that so feminism is the advocacy of women's rights on the grounds of equality of the sexes while gender equality is the state in which access to rights or opportunities is unaffected by gender i repeat access to rights or opportunities unaffected by gender and feminism is mainly considered concerned with the rights of women while gender equality is concerned with rights of everyone every human being irrespective of their gender Here there is a clear line of difference between feminism and gender equality. So, I cannot forget to mention gender equity, which is the most neutral approach for human development. I repeat, it is the most neutral approach for human development and not for women development or men development. 
Gender equality means that women and men have equal condition in the full exercise of their human rights to contribute to national, political, economical, social, and cultural development and to benefit from their results. While gender equity gives opportunities to both sexes, gender equality focuses mainly on the idea that women and men are different. So opportunities depend on specific characteristics, context, and needs in which they find themselves and which they have from various peers in which they interact, like workplace, educational, health, economic, cultural, and social spheres in general. These are all the spheres in which we interact in our daily lives. So how are these laws so unfair to men? So these are all the points that makes us feel that these laws are very much biased towards women, making it unfair for men. Because the law focuses only on the plight of the women and ignores the male gender completely. It is so evident from the slides and the sections we discussed earlier. The law presents the view that men who suffer abuse from women have to bear with it as the law provides no means to protect them. The patriarchal laws makes it obligatory for men to be financially aid for the family throughout his life, while the women can have the privilege of being dependent on the men or the husband of the family. These laws are trying to enable women while depriving men. There's no wrong in trying to enabling women or men, but it should not be the cost of the other gender. And it also presents a perception that women are weak and hence need extra support and maintenance by men. This is so out fashion thought because we all see how women are equally capable and how they are equally participating in the society today. And only women dignity is given importance and men are helpless fighting for their modesty. So do we need gender neutral laws? Yes, according to me, because empowering a particular gender should not mean demeaning the other. Equality should be achieved by the way of equal treatment of both the genders rather than blind prom promotion of one gender. And with respect to crimes, women commit crime for the same reasons that men do. Crime has no gender, neither should our laws. Gender neutral laws are no way against feminism, but it rather seeks to achieve the very, very basic objective of feminism, that is equality. So this is all about the feminist laws. If you have any doubts regarding the explanation, you can please unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, Deepa, I have a question. Like yeah. uh, in the section 14, what did you mean by absolute property? Isn't that, for example, uh, for a parent, if there are two children, like one man and one woman, wouldn't they get the equal share of the property? Yes, yes. So I'll clarify that. Thank you, Nagarjun. So this section 14, let me go to the slide. Yeah. Section 14 of Hindu law property of a Hindu female to be her absolute property. So under Hindu law, it was clear that there is no distinction between male and female with respect to the sharing of the property. So if, if the parents have two children, one daughter and one son, both of them will get equal share irrespective of gender. But where the law lacks and makes it biased to women is in section 14 that is once the property is divided among the son and the daughter the difference is that the share that the daughter gets is regarded as an absolute property meaning she can do anything with the property she can mortgage it she can sell it she can give it as a way of gift or she can will it she can do whatever she wants. But it is not the same case for the Hindu male because there's an obligation that they have to get the consent of their hires. 
meaning if the uh, son who gets the share has his son and his daughters then he has to get their consent before proceeding with the property so this is what absolute property means so the share that the hindu female gets is regarded as an absolute property as if it is her self earned property but it is not the same case with the hindu male is it clear yeah thanks for the clarification thank you so that was all about feminist laws thank you for participating